The preceding program pre-recorded. 690 Radio, your country music station, WELD in Fisher, West Virginia. Good morning and welcome to Morning Star Time. If you're going to be in Moorfield, the place to stay is Harper's Motel. That's because Harper's Motel is the only place to stay. But the lack of competition hasn't affected Bill Harper's service any. You get a good, clean, air-conditioned room, plenty of linen, color TV, bucket of ice, and if you want, a flag decal that says, I'm proud to be an American. You see lots of these around town, probably twice the national average. You find them all over the windows of cars, trucks, and stores. One young fellow had a peace symbol, but he kept it hidden on the inside panel of his car door. I'd say that hair is one to two inches shorter than the national average. And if you see a beard, you can bet it's on a farmer, not a hippie. Most of what there is to see of Moorfield business is right here on Main Street. In fact, most of what there is to see of Moorfield is right here on Main Street. Moorfield is a very thin town. The Moorfield Presbyterian Church is an old one. During the Civil War, it was used as a hospital by both sides. However, the Yankees, being uncouth louts, stabled their horses inside the church and used the pews for firewood. The local residents were so scandalized by this indiscretion that they demanded $800 indemnity from Washington. It took them 53 years, but they got it. And then there's Helen's Restaurant. Helen's specialty is buckwheat cakes, made the old-fashioned way. Helen told us she got her recipe off an Aunt Jemima box. Now, I've tasted Aunt Jemima's buckwheat cakes, and I've tasted Helen's buckwheat cakes. And I think there's something Helen's holding back. That morning, we ran into a guy named Butch Pope. Butch runs the Easy Loan Company. He's a self-acclaimed character who cultivates a cynical attitude toward Moorfield, his adopted home. He pegged us as strangers right away. If uh, a stranger comes to town, he wants to uh, come in the restaurant or whatever. He hides all his belongings under a blanket and then locks his car. But uh, an in-town person, leave a shotgun or rifle propped against the side of his car and binoculars on the seat. He didn't have to worry about somebody stealing it because they don't belong to them. And they won't bother. watch our obituaries to see whether we've died or not, who has died and who has not. Sometimes we greet them with glee and sometimes we're a little unhappy. Uh, Nine o'clock every morning, local station just comes on you with obituaries. And I expect out of 2,200 people, 1,900 of them are listening.
Time now for the obituary notices. Kind of a groovy thing was uh, a couple of years ago, one of the announcers said that he was awfully sorry there weren't any obituaries for that day. Listen every day at 9 o'clock for the obituary notices. Anytime there is a bereavement in your family, you wish to have announced on the obituary notices, all arrangements must be made through your funeral director. There's more togetherness in the small community. And as the old saying is, when somebody bleeds, we all bleed, and they sympathize, you know, with their relatives and friends that pass away, of course. Funeral business is one of the bigger things around town. Uh, right at the castle, we've got two funeral homes in town. Uh, some of the citizenry have been keeping a box score uh, to see who's doing the business, and I think currently it's uh, 20 to 6 or 20 to 8 in favor of the newest uh, uh, setup. A small town graveyard is much more than a place to bury dead people. It's a personal link with the past, a kind of private history written in family names and inscribed on granite tablets. Some of the oldest tombstones bear names that are still found on a lot of the downtown stores. And everybody agrees it's a sad business when a family daughter's out. On this hill, there are two separate graveyards, one black, one white. It's always been this way, and nobody gives it much thought. The schools have been integrated for years, so is almost everything else. But here, tradition is king. It's hard to imagine that this idyllic spot was once the scene of incredible violence. It started among the Indians. Various tribes warred incessantly over the right to graze their cattle and grow their crops in this fertile valley. This tradition kept up until old John Van Meter, a Dutch trader, passed through the valley with the Delaware Indian War Party. Old John looked the land over and decided that it was just a little too opulent to be wasted on Indians. So with a little help from his sons and a couple of generations of tough-minded pioneers, the Indians got the idea and moved out. After the French and Indian War, there was some squabbling between Virginia and Maryland over whose rum bought the land rights from the Indians. Virginia won out. But all that changed when the Civil War broke out. Most of the voting age residents of Hardy County were out fighting for the Confederacy. A couple of unscrupulous Yankee sympathizing scoundrels slipped off to a convention in Wheeling and voted Hardy County, along with seven other neighboring counties, out of the state of Virginia and into the new northern-oriented state of West Virginia. as to what a pastor should be, uh, the image of, of the minister that they recalled when they were children, probably. This is a self-contained community. We've got mountains surrounding us on all sides. I sensed this when I, when I first came in here, that when I came down the mountain road and into the valley here, that I was entering another world. It's, a, it's the pace is slower, the, the values are still here, values that have long since disappeared in the urban situation. And these people will tenaciously hold on to these values because they find security in this. Most of the young people I've talked to feel like the church is a luxury of their parents. Uh, it really, it's all right as long as they're, they're children, but when they get 15, 16 years old, most of them wander out of, of the Sunday school, seldom attend worship unless they're forced. You want me to drink this beer? One, three. One, two, three. There it goes, ladies and gentlemen. That's all. Cases 
young people are interested, uh, they have too many outside interests that uh, would tend to draw them away from the church, I believe. Maybe we, maybe we older people uh, are not giving them what they want. Maybe, maybe this is the answer. I don't know, but they just anything to do, really. I mean, there's not hardly any place to go unless you have your license, and just the same old thing every day, all the time. The good part is everybody knows everybody, so it, you can do, really, there's, in one way there's nothing to do, and in another there's lots to do, because you can go riding around, just riding around, listen to the radio, that's about as much fun as anything. Well, we come down here, come down, and have fun, and do what we want. we got a room in the back, we'll keep the law off our back, we're all right. What do you think this is a bad place? Do you think we still do? We don't. All this stuff, I'm serious. It's a great place. Really, you ask any of these boys. I get a lazy streak, somebody comes in, I say, go help yourself. And they just go help yourself, put the money in the cash register, and leave. There's been times when people come in, get a six pack of beer, put the money in the cash register, and leave, not even say a word to them. You know? Straight system. What do you think is What do the people like to talk about? Most of the people don't bother with the movie, so there's no problem there, you know, it's just television and the drive-in. You want to know who laughs loudest in the flick when, when the people on the screen says nigger? Upstairs, baby. Hey! That's that, 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 that nigger! <laughs> huh? Huh? You do! On a whole, it's, it's better here than any place I've ever been. is the poultry capital of West Virginia. Now this may or may not be accurate, but one thing is certain. The chicken industry is the backbone of the town's economy. 17 years ago, Wendell Hester came to town looking for a place to locate his company. Presbury Cook Foods, our corporation, came to town begging. Uh, we were an extremely small firm. We only had uh, three employees. And um, the... Uh, Merchants of the town loaned the company $20,000 to enable it to move from Ann Arbor, Michigan here. Rockingham is a processing plant, which is poultry talk for a slaughterhouse. Some 47,000 luckless birds meet their fate here in a single day. At 25 cents a pound, we figured the plant grosses about $35,000 a day. The workers average $1.80 an hour, and they range in age from 16 to 63. There is a union here, the meat cutters, but not everybody wants to belong, so nobody makes them. Over 20% of all Moorfield residents are directly employed by the two poultry companies, Rockingham and Pierce. We asked Mr. Hester what would happen if the poultry industry should suddenly vanish from Moorfield. Very disastrous. Very. They will 
would be a complete disappearance of, I would say, 80% of the, of the people in the area if Rockingham and, and Pierce were both to close, because you not only have your employees that are directly working for you, and you can multiply the number of total employees between our two plants by either four or five to get the number of dependents that are involved, then you take your service people in town and your shops, so uh, there would be practically nothing left. Moorfield was primarily an agricultural dependent town, but uh, it too found that it was unable to uh, keep pace with the rest of the nation because the um, farms, relatively speaking, are quite small and they just couldn't compete financially. And uh, the young people had to start to look elsewhere for jobs. Roger, when he finished high school, he was kind of settled and staying on the farm, which I don't suppose you could blame him. We don't have enough fellows that's doing that today. But they have a small farm, actually. They got a lot of acreage, maybe, but uh, as far as the farming potential, it was rather small. Too small for him to make a, a decent living, a comfortable living for he and his wife. Mm -hmm. So he was in hopes that he could expand his farm without buying this expensive land that we run into here in this particular area. So he uh, expanded by going into the broiler business, which is, has helped him an awful lot on his farm to make it possible for him to have a comfortable income and be able to stay home on the farm and don't have to move to the city like so many of our youth from this particular area have done in the past. Well, we had a class reunion the other day, but I think there's only about 10 or 20 percent probably that's still around in the county. And a probably smaller percent yet that's work, staying on the farm in there, Roger. Yeah, there's only two or three of the whole class that's still on the farm. Our farm was uh, small compared to what we could earn other places, and we had to increase our uh, income some way to stay on the farm. So we decided we investigate the chicken business, and we did, and we visited a uh, good many chicken operations and come up with the idea to build one of these chicken houses. We have a uh, capacity of 22,000 birds right now. We raise them for eight weeks, and then they're sent to slaughter at Moorfield. Well, I've always uh, loved the farm and wanted to be a farmer as long as I can remember. And other than that, I don't know. Well, the people that went to school and got a good education has got uh, a lot bigger jobs and they have a lot bigger income than we have. And I know we'll make a lot more money than we'll ever make, but I'm happy uh, just being on the farm and being free and being our own boss. Former Senator Betty Baker has the distinction of being the only woman ever elected to the West Virginia State Legislature. She's deeply concerned about the future of her town. We asked her what would become of Moorfield if no new industry could be persuaded to locate here. Well, I, I really hate to think about it because uh, we need something here to hold our young people or to bring our young people back. And, they're not coming back here unless they come in as professional people. Now, we do have, uh, well, just in the last month or six weeks, a young lawyer came back. He was a native Moorfield boy, and, and he came back as going to practice law. When I completed law school, I decided that I'd uh, like to open a private practice here. At first, I wasn't sure if I could afford it economically. But then uh, if you decide that you don't want to be rich, then a small town like this uh, normally provides very adequate income. Let's see. Uh, let's get that just about right there. Here's the sweat. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, they you find something here? Uh, well, I'm going to have to seriously start looking for a job. I've just worked a few odd jobs here and there. And about that, that time in my life when I'm going to have to think about the future. And... Uh, Joint society, I guess that's what you say, or the establishment. And so I'm afraid I'm just going to have to get it cut, as much as I hate to. You have to be prepared to sacrifice to live in a small town like this. There are many things. Uh, we don't have any Major League Baseball, as I'm sure you would know, and we don't have any professional football. And uh, we don't have big movie theaters. 
and so forth. And there are more serious uh, objections to living in a small town. Uh, in this particular area, we don't have uh, adequate hospitals, adequate ambulance services, and so forth. But uh, on the other hand, we don't have as many cars on the highway to uh, hit you with, and we don't have as much need for them. I can really enjoy myself around here. I have a lot of friends, and I think everybody is sort of comfortable here in Northfield. It's, it's not really a rat race, as most of the big cities are. And I really don't know if somebody I'll be here the rest of my life there or not. I mean, now I'm single, and really the girls around here, there aren't that many. And for a young guy like me, I think it'd be best to get out for a little while and possibly come back later. The problem with all the young people in West Virginia is that uh, when they become of of age, so to speak, 18 or 19, when they finish high school, they're lured to the east and to the south and to the north, everywhere. Uh, widespread communications, and they see all kinds of uh, uh, surfers this and sunset strip that, and uh, they think those are the things they'd like to do. And uh, they go do these things and uh, sometimes get caught up in them and never come back. But I'm here, and I think we need young people. The Moorfield Examiner is a weekly newspaper with a distribution of about 3,500. It's the oldest family-owned business in town. The editor is a talented young woman named Phoebe Fisher. When her father died, Phoebe returned home to take over the paper. I'm a little young as compared to most of the people in this area. I uh, am faced with trying to take over in the shoes of my father in one respect. He was well, he was well respected. Uh, it's, this is a very difficult thing to do. A weekly paper shows a little different purpose from a, a daily newspaper in that it's more interested in the individuals who live door to, next door to each other or the, uh, the people down the street. You know everyone in town anyway, but it's always nice to know when they've had a new baby or when they've gone to see the doctor or when they've uh, had a tea party or whatever's going on. We grow up here, uh, I know it has its problems and its faults, but it also has a lot of good points. I've been away, I've lived in a few cities, but there's just something about a small town that appeals to me. I don't want to see more feel over industrialized because I don't want a lot of the aspects of our small town living destroyed, but we do need something more if we're going to keep our young people or get them to come back. But there's one thing that I don't think we have paid enough attention to. Now, we have a group called Potomac Highlands. It's a an organization that takes in an 11-county area here in the Panhandle. And they're interested in developing tourism. And I learned when I was in the legislature that most people don't look at tourism as an industry, but it really is. It's a dollar and cents industry, just the same as bringing a factory in. And uh, this area is certainly ripe for tourist development. The people from Washington and uh, the uh, metropolitan area down there are buying land for second homes or retirement homes. And it's starting uh, to move in a little in the Hardy County. First of all, we came up to this part of the country to escape the big city pressures and uh, activities and the uh, impossibility to get down and, and get next to the things that we think are important and things that, that, that people are really living for. We don't miss our commuting or all our pressures in offices one bit. People here are, uh, we think, more genuine. Uh, they know who they are. They know where they're going. They're wonderful people. They're honest as they can be, and they're a real education and inspiration to us. The reason is, of course, because these people are, are probably uh, uh, in the poverty class as far as uh, uh, dollars are concerned, but they are probably richer in knowledge and experience and day-to-day -day joy and the satisfaction that they get from living and, and doing the work that they are doing. They're living close to the earth close to the soil, and uh, there are people that are tremendously ob observant of all that goes on around them. They're very much in tune with their environment. And as a matter of fact, in, in tune with each other because they are working together at, at nearly all things. 
This section of the state fights sort of a losing battle because we have an awful hard time in the eastern panhandle convincing the powers that be in Charleston that we're a part of the state and we've been neglected in the highway system and things like that. Actually, this panhandle is the gateway to West Virginia because it opens up that whole eastern uh, seaboard, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, all that area. This is the gateway. And if we could ever get through to the boys in Charleston that we're here and how important we are, and I think one of these days we're going to make that breakthrough. Moorefield never really bridged the gap to the machine age. You can tell it when you breathe the clean air. And you can tell it when you watch the water of the South Branch River run by clear and unpolluted. You can tell it in the evening when you walk down unlighted sidewalks and there are no truck sounds grating against the quiet. You can tell it when people stop what they're doing to talk to you. And the conversation is unhurried, the way people talk who are used to listening and being listened to. And you can't help feeling that this is all going to change. And you can't help wishing it won't. Ellen Leatherman, Captain Fisher and Charles Flower, Mr. Wise Terry Bean, Ralph Bean in his car, Ralph Bean again, a Hooter boy, Fluff Morris, Dick Taylor, Ruby Dasher's daughter. Ronald well, Love, Rich Stell. S.L. Dodd. Fred Strider, Dr. Love in the distance. Mamie Birch. Edward Wayne, uh, Lucia Dawson. Ellen Harwood, Junior Miley, Mona Keith, Mr. Thrush on the right, 
Diane Martin, Nick Turtles Out, Elizabeth Wilson, Ali Arnold, Ali again, Puppy, Lang Weiss, Marcel Hellman, George Fenley, Kate Price, Elwood, all the channels for me. Bill Grafton, get the sheriff up on the right. Dr. Harmon and Bill Grafton. Ed Wolf. Leona Hammer. Mr. Fallon. Pat Savelle. Isabel Molly, John Fennel, Ralph Fisher, Mona Keith, Mr. Dasher, John Harmison, Orpha C, and Mr. Fallon. Les McCauley, Sheriff Matthias, Virgil Christ, Sheriff Matthias, Dolly Redman, Ed Sager, Mo Ab Simmons, Mo Ab Simmons again, Bob Powers, Lewis Helfel, Guy Rigsby, Carlton, Dasher, and Calhoun. Mr. Mallory Flower, Mr. Robert Cuttendall, Mr. Poole, Dr. Baker, Elvis Shane Holtz, Wade Dean, Julian Schiffler. Brown McNeil, Edna Gamble, Chester Hyatt and Shuffer. Pat Clark. Hide again. Mm -hmm. 
Let's put that big cross on the left in front. This is grafting. Dolan. 
Serve massage. Cook flowers. Jim Molly. Ellen Collins showing us the class. Mr. Hyde. Luba Shell. Captain Rain. Our Hooter, Leona Hammer, Bean, Mike Wilson on the right. Then Molly on the left, and Mike Wilson again. Big Boy Rumors. Red Harrison. James Bobo. Robert Marshall on the right, Mr. Matson, Mind of the Family. Mr. John Tom Bowman on the extreme left. Ben Sam. Mark Whittington.
Julian Cole. Mr. Nelson, Pedro Bowman on the right, Carl Baldwin, Mr. Hattershell, Road Trip to History is made possible in part by Founded in 1777 and nestled in the beautiful Potomac Highlands, surrounded by historic valleys and rich pasture land, you will find one of West Virginia's best kept secrets. Welcome to historic Moorfield, West Virginia. The first inhabitants of the South Branch Valley were Indian tribes who hunted and cleared fields where they raised crops. The Seneca Trail ran through the valley. In 1725, John Van Meter, an Indian trader from New York, explored what is now Hardy County. He found the Indian fields and described the broad valley as the best land he had yet seen. The settlers received land grants from Lord Fairfax and the Commonwealth of Virginia or bought and leased land from distant holders of grants. Lord Fairfax hired George Washington and others to survey his land. In the 1750s, the British were fighting the French and the Indians. Fort Pleasant, established by George Washington, figured in the Battle of the Trough, where settlers were ambushed. The count given was seven whites, and three Indians killed. No forts are standing today, but the meeting house built in 1812 and the house built by the Meters in 1832 were both named Fort Pleasant for the fort located nearby. During the Revolutionary War, families supplied wagons and foodstuffs to support Washington's army. The first cattle drive from the area may have been cattle collected for Washington's army 
and sun on the hoof down the South Branch Valley and the river. Moorefield, established in 1777 by the Virginia General Assembly on land donated by Conrad Moore, was placed near the center of the valley at the confluence of the South Fork and the South Branch of the Potomac River. It is the fourth oldest town in West Virginia. Half acre lots were sold and the new owners were required to build an 18 square foot structure with a chimney of stone or brick within two years of purchasing the lot. The Higgins House was one of these. The Old Stone Tavern built by Thomas Parsons in 1788 is the only building in town constructed of field stone. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. Moorefield was a part of Hampshire County and the county seat was in Romney, 35 miles away. That was deemed too far for the conduct of business, so in 1786, Hardy County was formed with Moorefield, its county seat. Farms large and small dotted the valley. The raising of beef was one of the most important activities, and Hardy became the leading county for beef production in Virginia and one of the leading counties in the United States. Shorthorn cattle were raised in these farms and driven by hoof over 100 miles to some of the cities of the east like Baltimore, Philadelphia, and others. Agricultural wealth then supported a lifestyle for the wealthy who built such beautiful homes as Willow Wall, built by the McNeils. By the mid-1850s, 25 manor homes had been built along the South Branch. A few of these homes were Mill Island, the Willows, and Hickory Hill. The town of Moorefield reflected the life of the rural community around and in 1850, there were 287 residents of whom 34 were free blacks and 87 were slaves. Private schools and tutors educated those who could pay among the wealthiest and their sons were able to attend colleges like the University of Virginia and William and Mary. For most of the century, citizens of Hardy County shared union churches. But in 1836, the Presbyterians voted to establish their own congregation. It's interesting to note that during the Civil War, the sanctuary was used by both sides as a hospital and possibly a stable. The most significant of the engagements around Moorefield was what was now known as the Battle of Moorefield, and which probably should be called the Battle of Holefield. There, Union forces surprised Confederate cavalry returning from a raid into Pennsylvania and Maryland and inflicted heavy casualties. Confederate and Union bodies both after, after the battle were laying out on the porch of Willow Wall. Hardy County's overwhelming support for the South during the war between the states can be seen by a stroll through Olivet Cemetery. The older section contains almost 150 graves of Confederate soldiers. The best known Confederate soldier from Hardy County was John Hanson McNeil. By the beginning of the war, he was living in Missouri where he had become a prominent cattleman as well as a lay preacher in his church. He returned to Hardy County where he formed the well-known partisan rangers group known as McNeil's Rangers. Mortally wounded in a successful attack on a Union force at Means Bottom in Virginia in October of 1864, he died a month later in Harrisonburg where he was buried with full Masonic honors and his men later had his body removed and brought back to Hardy County. George Washington A. Little was a free black man who served in McNeil's Rangers. He was nicknamed Mammy Little because of his duties with, as commissary sergeant. He was one of the first men to reach Captain McNeil when he was mortally wounded. And after the war, when he died in Grant County in 1908, his body was returned to Hardy County where he was buried in the Confederate Circle. 
Abraham Spengler was the highest ranking Confederate officer from Hardy County. Small in stature, he only stood five feet four. He enlisted as captain of the, in the 33rd Virginia, part of the famed Stonewall Brigade. He was wounded at Cedar Mountain and returned to duty and by the end of the war had been promoted to colonel and was commanding a brigade. John J. Chipley entered the war as a private in the Hardy Blues and when they were reorganized in 1862, he was elected captain. He was wounded at Newmarket, Virginia, and by the end of the war, had been promoted to major. At the end of the war, he resumed his law practice in Moorfield and was later elected mayor of Moorfield. Richard C. Price was a five foot, eight inch, 18 year old when he enlisted in the 7th Virginia Cavalry. He served throughout the war and was paroled in Romney in 1865. His mother also served the Confederacy as postmistress in Moorfield during the war. After the war, he became a prominent businessman and farmer. When he died in 1926, he was the last Confederate soldier in Moorfield. The words on the monument to Confederate war dead in Olivet Cemetery express very well the feelings of most of the people in Hardy County just eight years after the war. The monument honors 125 men who were from Hardy County or who died in Hardy County during the war. It stands in the middle of the Confederate circle, which contains the graves of many of the men listed on it. And that will have the laying of the wreath. From the time it was erected until well into the 20th century, ceremonies were held here honoring Hardy County's Confederate soldiers. This tradition has been revived by McNeil's Rangers Camp 582, the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Each year, they hold a ceremony and decorate graves with flags and candle luminaries and read the names of the men being honored, followed by a rifle and sometimes cannon salute. Morford Examiner is the oldest family-owned business in, still in existence in Hardy County, or still running in Hardy County. Uh, my grandfather, Samuel A. McCoy, purchased the paper in 1902, and he ran it until his death in 35, after which my mother and father took over the paper. In 1969, I came back as the editor and publisher of the paper and have been there for 40 years. The Morford Examiner is a, an award-winning newspaper, both editorial and advertising. It's been recognized for general excellence by the West Virginia Press Association. And there's always been an editorial page, which is not always true of, of weekly papers, but we have, we have maintained that tradition in our family. The family has taken the paper from handset type at the, after the turn of the century to hot metal to cold type and in the last several years we have gone online and we electronically send our paper to a printer 60 miles from Moorfield every week and it's, uh, it's a century of of change not only for the family but also for the, the method in which we publish the paper. The examiner's predecessors have been tracked back to 1845. The first paper in, in Moorfield was the Courier Advertiser and it was located in a building no longer standing. It was called the Taylor Building on the corner of Winchester and, and Main. Two memories, one of my earliest memory of, of the newspaper and of my family's involvement, I was probably about four. My father was in the Navy, my mother was trying to continue the paper's regular publication. And I was sitting across the desk from her in the office writing a letter to Santa Claus. My mother very carefully folded it up, and put it in an envelope, addressed it, and then sent it to Santa by way of the wood stove. The second memory that left a, a real impression on me was 
when the flood of November 4 and 5 hit Northfield. The examiner is a record keeper uh, of events affecting Moorfield, uh, the area, uh, activities of our readers and, and, and school events, what our elected officials and government offices do. One of the things that's unique to the area was something called Ride the Fantastics. It was a mummers parade, New Year's Day, men dressed up, um, rode horseback, uh, drank great quantities of, of alcohol and had a good time. The bar band was a family of, of musicians from the rig area who appeared at political gatherings, uh, parades, picnics, whatever, wherever they were needed or wherever they wanted to show up, that's where they would be. Captain Hugh Barr, who started the band, served as a drummer under Stonewall Jackson. Moorfield High School made local history in 1996 when the local football team won the state championship. It didn't just win that year though, it won the next four years. The Moorfield Examiner has been very proud to be part of the history of, of Moorfield and the area for 107 years. We hope to be around for another 100. Walking through the town of Moorfield can be like a journey back in time with street after street of beautifully restored buildings, homes, landscapes, and gardens. Some of the more historic buildings include the Maslin House, built in 1848 by one of Hardy County's leading political spokesman, Thomas Maslin. Built in 1793, this was the second courthouse, and it was used as a courthouse until 1860. Built in 1907, Innskeep Hall was the community center, and it now houses the Moorfield Town Government. The Parsons House, one of the four remaining original log houses in Moorfield, Captain James Parson, veteran of the French and Indian and Revolutionary Wars, purchased the lot in 1785. It's easy to see that the people of Moorfield and Hardy County are proud of their history and culture. The Moorfield Tannery was built by Thomas Cover and his family, and Moorfield was selected because of the vast resources of, of chestnut bark located in this area. The tannery had a capacity of 100 hives per day. The main products there were sole leather and belting leather. The tannery closed in the late 70s. Moorfield is the poultry capital of West Virginia and also the home of the uh, uh, West Virginia Poultry Association. Uh, the poultry industry started its major growth at, during World War II. Uh, with this growth, uh, Rockingham Poultry Marketing Cooperative uh, built a new processing plant in Moorfield in 1944. Another poultry industry located here was Pierce Chick of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mr. Hester purchased Pierce Chick in 1964. Mr. Hester was a very visionary person uh, for poultry products for the, for the food service trade. One of 